get to do the next life-giving path on our series of life-giving paths. This one is not so simple. Maybe that's why Nathan gave it to me. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to start with a story. I was five years old when my family got our first television. It was a 12-inch black and white TV with rabbit ears. You're all very excited for me. And from where we lived in Dundas, Ontario, we could probably get five or six channels, I would guess, um, with the rabbit ears. But that didn't matter because my brother and I, very limited options in what we were allowed to watch. During the week, it was Polka Dot Door and Sesame Street. And that was it. That was it. And I went to kindergarten in the mornings, and that's when those shows were on, so I got nothing during the week. But on weekends, on holidays, you know, there was a few more options. And specifically Saturday mornings. Couldn't watch TV on Sunday mornings. That wasn't allowed. But specifically Saturday mornings, we could get up at 6 a.m. and go down and turn on the television and watch Saturday morning cartoons until breakfast at about 9 a.m. And the very first cartoon at 6 a.m. in the morning on our TV in 1985 was Rocket Robin Hood. Does anybody else remember Rocket Robin Hood? Yes, 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 we're all dating ourselves, that's fine. Uh, I found out this week that Rocket Robin Hood was a Canadian cartoon written in 1966. So even if you're older than me, you might have watched this when you were five or six. And there were only ever three seasons, but man, did this thing have a lifespan. 1966, I was still watching it in 1986. Um, and I didn't know anything about it uh, other than what I remembered from it as a show until this week. I didn't even realize it was in color. So that's, that's where we were at with that. Um, and uh, somehow, you know, polka dot, Pokeroo became purple and Big Bird became yellow because they, I was still watching them with my brother sometimes when we got our color TV in 88. But uh, Rocket Robin Hood was forever black and white. And I guess you might be wondering why I'm admitting to my deeply restrictive media habits uh, to start a sermon on seven life-giving paths, but bear with me, because this clip was the very first thing I thought of when I thought about our topic this morning. Does anybody remember this? It was at the end of every single little vignette. There were like three vignettes in every show. And at the end of every single vignette was this little, little thing where he'd take a bite out of the food, toss it over his shoulder, take a bite out of the next food, toss it over the shoulder. And so that's the picture I had in my head when I started thinking about gluttony. It's this picture of eating beyond what was needed and in this horribly wasteful way. Turns out it wasn't far off. So Wikipedia's definition of gluttony is overindulgence and overconsumption of anything to the point of waste. Now, I think that's a pretty clear description. But if we try to look up the idea of gluttony in the Bible, there aren't actually a lot of verses in the Bible that use the word gluttony. Do I have a microphone now? This always feels like We're the talk. excited. Yes. Talk amongst yourself, but also, this is exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was told to put it down low. I'm, am I good? Hopefully. Okay. So the Bible doesn't really use this word gluttony very much. So then that made it difficult to write a sermon about what we're doing instead of gluttony. But it does come out a couple of times. So the biggest, longest passage about gluttony is in Numbers chapter 11. And it's this really weird story set during the time that the Israelites are wandering in the desert after they had escaped from Egypt, right? So God has been providing them manna in the desert, and they've been wandering around, and every day God provides them manna, and every six days he provides them enough manna for two days, and that's it. That's what they get. And it is nutritious and uh, sustaining, but it may or may not be delicious. And no matter what, they are tired of it. And they're bored of it. And they want something better than this. And so they do what they do. 
these people of Israel as they're wandering in the desert, what do they do? They complain. They complain. They whine. They whinge. They fuss. They make a big deal. They go around weeping and gnashing their teeth and wishing and praying that they could just go back to Egypt where they can eat fish to their slaved heart's content. They would rather be slaves in Egypt than have to live with manna in the desert. Yeah, it's crazy. It's ridiculous. And God has this really weird response to their complaint. Maybe God's done this to you once or twice. Maybe you've prayed for something. God's like, okay, you want that? Okay, you can have that. Here you go. This is what happens. God doesn't just give them meat in the form of quails. This is this bird here. If you don't know what a quail is, I wasn't quite sure what it looked like either. God, this is what it says in Numbers 11. You shall eat quail not only one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes, until it becomes comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him saying, why did we leave Egypt? That's exactly what happens. God's punishment, as it were, for complaining is to give them an overabundance of what they've asked for, which is not as great as it might seem. A wind blows and quails are brought in from the sea. So many quails that they are almost a meter deep across all all around the camp for a journey of a day's walk in every direction. And the people gather the quails and they start to eat them and immediately a great plague passes through the camp. And it says that they named the place Kibroth Hatava, or the Graves of Craving, because it was there they buried the people who had craved other food. They had been gluttonous, and it got them in trouble. If we keep looking for verses on gluttony, the next one is Ezekiel 16. I swear I didn't choose this just for my own sake. This is the next verse on gluttony, because this is where the prophet tells us about why Sodom was destroyed. Now remember, Sodom was that city in the book of Genesis that God destroyed because he couldn't find 10 righteous people in it. And there are many people who would like to tell us that they know why Sodom is destroyed. But their answer is different than Ezekiel's because Ezekiel tells us that the reason they sinned, that the way that they sinned was that they were gluttonous and they failed to practice hospitality. Specifically, they failed to be welcoming to those who were different than them. There are just a couple of other references in the Bible to gluttony. Uh, There's a couple in the Gospels where uh, Jesus is accused of eating and drinking with gluttons. We can go on to the next slide, Carrie as if the proximity to gluttony somehow besmirches his character. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul chastises the Corinthian church because some, some of the people, the rich people, to be clear, are coming and eating all the food uh, for their communion meal. They're stuffing themselves silly before other people, the poor ones, have a chance to even get there. And apart from an odd verse or two in Proverbs, and I really do mean odd, that's kind of what there is on the topic in the Bible. There's not a lot in the Bible on gluttony. The best we can say from that is that um, gluttony isn't something we maybe should be aiming for as a spiritual discipline. Still one problem, though. Uh, Does anyone actually know what gluttony is from that? It's kind of unclear, right? If it's just eating one bite of a chicken drumstick or a bunch of grapes and throwing the rest of it over our shoulder, or begging God for quail in the middle of the desert, or finishing all the snacks before everyone gets to church, then I don't know whether we really need a life-giving path for this one, because I'm not sure anyone of us is actually 
gluttonous. I don't, I don't know that this actually applies to us. Based on the information we've got so far, this isn't talking about people who enjoy a great uh, evening of food with friends, and we're not talking about people who go to a chess and whiskey evening. Um, and, and so, like, why do we even need this sermon? But I got stuck on this definition, this overindulgence or overconsumption to the point of waste. I thought maybe that would be a thread that would be worth pulling for us. I, I got thinking about it in part because I was listening to one of my kids' friends talk about their job that they've recently quit. Um, and they were working at the food counter of an organic uh, grocery store. And like many online, uh, minimum wage jobs, this job had lots of challenges. But one of the things that bugged her the most about this job was how much food they wasted every day. She said just from their kitchen, not from the entire grocery store, just from their kitchen, they threw out about six kilos of food every day on average. Sometimes it was more than that. And it turns out that it's not just this tiny blip of food waste happening uh, in Canada. Does anyone know how much household food we waste every year? Just, just families, households throwing out food every year. According to the City of Toronto's waste reduction page, Canadian households throw out 2.3 million tons of food every year. 2.3 million tons is a really big number. It's one of those really big numbers that makes it hard for us to know how big a number it is. So I tried to like get a mental picture of it. And I tried doing some math with the internet. Maybe the numbers aren't perfect, but hopefully this gives us like at least a sense, okay? So a ton is like a thousand kilograms, which is great. And, and then that's like 2,200 pounds. And I was like, okay, so how much does 2,200 pounds look like? It's like, I don't, I don't know. But I know how much 10 pounds looks like. 10 pounds looks like a bag of potatoes, right? We can all picture a 10 pound bag of potatoes. Okay, so when you get a pallet of these 10 pound bags of potatoes, I'm not quite sure what size pallet they're talking about here, but apparently some pallets of 10 pound bags of potatoes are uh, a single ton. They weigh 1,000 kilograms. There's 220 10 pound bags on, of potatoes on some pallets. Couldn't figure out how, how big exactly, but you know, we're, we're doing our best. We're working with what we got. Should have called Dave. Anyways, if one pallet of potatoes is about a ton, just work with me. The next thing I wanted to know is how much space 2.3 million pallets of potatoes we're going to take up, right? And I started thinking about the Super Bowl, because that happened last Sunday. And those big, long platforms that the halftime show was performed on, I was like, huh. Well, I wonder how many football fields 2.3 million pallets of potatoes would take up. So you can fit 3,529 pallets on a football field if you spread them out, you know, right up next to each other. Um, which, you know, that's a lot of pallets, but not 2.3 million. So you would need 652 football fields to hold all of those pallets of potatoes. I was like, okay, still not quite sure on exactly what that looks like. And I found this weird, con you know, how big is it uh, site on the internet. And, and it turns out if instead of putting them in single rows, nice and neatly stacked, all those pallets, we just threw all those bags of potatoes into something, it would take three Houston Astrodomes to fit all those bags of potatoes. Just from households, just from Canada, just one year. That's a lot of food waste. And that doesn't include all the agricultural waste, it doesn't include all the grocery store waste, it doesn't include all of the waste from restaurants, that's just households, that's just food we have bought ourselves and taken home to eat. 
And it turns out back in 2017, we all know what food prices have done since 2017, right? Back in 2017, this was costing us on average $1,300 per household, per year. If the definition of gluttony is overindulgence and overconsumption to the point of waste, we might not just have some individual problems, we might have a collective problem. And it's not just a problem with food waste either. We overconsume and overindulge all sorts of things to the point of waste. The average Canadian spends 21 hours a week watching TV, movies, and streaming services. The average Canadian spends an hour and 46 minutes scrolling social media every day. And Canadians consume so much stuff that we produce the highest amount of garbage per capita in the world with an average of 2.7 kilograms of waste every day, of which only 30% we recycle. We have a collective problem. So when Nathan set out this sermon series for us, he put moderation as the life-giving path to glut away from gluttony. And honestly, I have to admit, when I saw it written down, I wasn't so sure. In fact, I think my response is quite telling because when I heard the word moderation, what my brain immediately went to was tiny, meager meals of stale bread and cheese and water and a room with hardback chairs and nothing beautiful or interesting in it. Which is clearly much more of an ascetic opposite end of the spectrum to gluttony sort of response and nothing like the life-giving paths we're aiming for. So I thought it was just me, but I was chatting with a friend on Tuesday and I asked her what she thought and she had a very similar response. She said it sounded like one, way for, one more way for someone to tell her what to do and that also didn't feel very life-giving. And maybe my friend and I are not the only one feeling that way right now. See, as soon as we start talking about easing off on how much we consume or indulge, most of us are going to get a little bit defensive. We might just start trying to back ourselves off, trying to justify the, the amount that we eat or drink or watch or scroll or buy or throw out. That We want to say that it's perfectly acceptable and it certainly doesn't constitute gluttony, and I'm right with you. If you're having those feelings right now, Join the club. I got to think about this all week. It's fun. Maybe you're shifting in your seats right now, wondering whether I've been watching you on a Friday night when you're having some beers with your friends, or whether I noticed how quickly you went through that chocolate cake, or whether I know about your entire large pizza, <coughs> Nathan, <coughs> that you ate through on your own last Saturday night. <coughs> That's just because he told me. Maybe you're worried I'm going to tell you that you need to give up or go on a diet or give up alcohol for Lent. I'm not, by the way. It's not the point here. Even if you're with me in terms of the idea that gluttony isn't the way to go, I think there's something in us that immediately reacts to this idea of moderation before we've even heard what it means. So I'm hoping you're going to at least give me a chance to unpack a few ideas before you tune me out. See, when I started looking at verses on moderation, I found several that had to do with self-control. Titus 1.8 tells us that the elder of a church should be, among other things, self-controlled. Good to know. Uh, Galatians 5.22-23 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit includes self-control. But honestly, even though I think self-control is an important fruit of the Spirit, I'm not convinced that it helps us understand what moderation is meant to look like or what the life-giving path that leads us away from gluttony is. And then I found this weird little gem in Proverbs 25, 16. This is what it says in the English Standard Version. If you have found honey, eat only enough for you, lest you have your fill and vomit it. Or... Then I was looking at all the other translations, because that's sometimes fun to do, and I, I, I found the message translation, and this is what it says. When you're given a box of candy, don't gulp it all down. 
eat too much chocolate and you'll make yourself sick. Will you now? Good to know. It made me wonder, why do we end up doing this gluttony thing? What is it that happens inside of us to make us gulp down so much honey or chocolate that we end up vomiting? What is it that would make us eat a whole pizza in one sitting? What makes us want to drink until we forget? What makes us buy so much food that we end up collectively throwing out three Houston Astrodomes worth of it every single year? As I was writing this sermon, I, I, I thought of three reasons, but I, I, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. First thing I think of is inattention. The people who are working on the food waste problems here in Canada have a, waste, have, have a number of solutions, and almost all of them have to do with bringing more intentionality to our actions around food. Make a meal plan, they say. Think about how we store our food more carefully, they say. But clearly, if they need to say those things, then maybe we aren't thinking about those things so much. In fact, maybe part of what happens when we are over-consuming to the point of wastefulness is that we're not paying enough attention to what's going on around us. That's the image I get of this verse in Proverbs. When you're given a box of candy, don't just gulp it all down, right? That we're not paying attention to what's going on around us, so we just keep reaching for more and more and more and miss that doing this will make us sick. So then I wondered, yeah, but why aren't we paying attention? I tend to think there's a reason for what we do, right? Why would we want to avoid taking in what's going on around us? I think maybe because we're overwhelmed by it all, right? I think sometimes we get so overwhelmed that some of us, you know, we just stop eating. Now, that's a different kind of problem. Some of us have a really hard time eating when we're overwhelmed. But some of us, what we do when we're overwhelmed is we eat and eat and eat and eat and eat, right? And we eat hoping that that food is going to make us feel safe, that it's going to remind us that we'll be okay. And now, some of us do this with food. Some of us do this maybe with alcohol. And some of us do this maybe with Netflix or social media. I do it with Amazon and theology books. When in doubt, buy another theology book. It'll probably solve the problem. I know. I haven't read them all. I know. I will. I promise. I promise. We each have our own things, right? Life can get really overwhelming sometimes. And we have lots of helpful and less than helpful ways of dealing with it. But I think sometimes this overwhelm leads us to gluttony. And then I think the third reason that we end up over-consuming and over-indulging is just because we've gotten so used to this as the baseline. We think of it as normal. Remember our stats on food waste? Like, it's not a you problem or a you problem or a you problem or a you problem. It's, a, it's an all of us problem. We're all doing it. When the garbages go to the curb at the end of the week, they, we, you can look along the curb. It's all pretty much the same amount of stuff coming out of everybody's house, right? And, and it gets to the point where we can just justify this as normal. But that doesn't mean it doesn't add up. It doesn't mean we don't end up with a problem. So what do we do with all of this? How do we get to a life-giving path when gluttony is seemingly so baked into our inattentive, overwhelmed, normative lives? I think the first answer is that we need to cultivate an awareness of the relationship we have with what we consume. This isn't about restricting ourselves or denying ourselves or anyone taking anything away from us that we don't want to have them take away from. Just like take that out of your head, that's not what I'm saying. Just like start paying attention. How much are we buying? How much are we gaming? How much are we watching Netflix? How much are we eating? How much are we drinking? How much are we consuming beyond what we need to the point that there is waste? And what are these actions and behaviors doing to our bodies and minds 
Are they making us healthier or making us sick? Are they making it easier or harder for us to follow Jesus? Maybe we keep a journal for a few weeks and observe our relationship with our consumption. And then if we do that, if you take me up on that idea, once we know how much we are consuming, we can start to ask some questions about how we feel about that consumption. And more importantly, how we feel about how that consumption impacts our lives. Maybe you decide everything's fine. You're good. You look at what you're consuming, you're like, no waste, no overindulgence, no overconsumption. Awesome. Can you come and tell me after you've done this how you're getting there? Because I'm not there yet. I've got some ideas for us, but I have not figured this out yet. So if you've got this, great. Listen and then like help me figure out what I'm missing, okay? In case you're also like me, a little bit lost on this one. Here's some of the things I thought of. The first thing I think we can get more intentional about is the fact that we are eating and drinking and watching and otherwise consuming. If we keep going with that journal and take it a step further and like notice as we're putting food in our mouth, right? Like just make it conscious, appreciate the art in front of us, appreciate the humor in front of us, take in the sensations of the things we're consuming, like actually consciously, physically take them in. To do that, we're going to have to slow down. Most of us are going a million miles a minute. On the weeks like the one I just had when I went to Toronto two times and I had assignments to finish and chores to do and a sermon to write and phone calls to answer and phone calls to make, I, it's not easy to be intentional about what I'm consuming. And it was kind of ironic when I finished a package of chocolates while writing a sermon <laughs> on gluttony. I'm just saying. That was the problem. This is one of, my, one of my points. I was like, oh, shoot, this doesn't work so well. This is not working so well for me, right? Or, or if we miss out on a beautiful day because we hold ourselves up in, our, in, a, in a dark room in the basement. Or, or if, if we miss out on the amazing conversation with a friend in front of us because we're just so worried about the next thing happening. And I think the solution is to slow down. We have to take pauses and breaks and actually write these into our schedules so that we can take the time to take in what's going on around us. I find it really interesting that Jesus has all of the 5,000 and the men and their women and children sit down in groups before he feeds them on the mountainside. They have this chance to take in what he is saying and what he is giving them and how he is providing for them. And because of that, there's not a lot of overindulgence. Nobody leaves sick. There's no plague this time, right? We need to be intentional. We need to slow down. And then I think we need to be careful about naming what we need. So one of the reasons we talked about feeling like uh, we aren't paying attention before is because of uh, feeling overwhelmed. And while it's all well and good for us to chant, you know, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, present your request to God, chanting this does not actually make you feel less overwhelmed or less anxious. I tried that a long time ago in a church that said that was the solution. Chanting it did not help. If we want to get to something more life-giving than gluttony, we still have to navigate this overwhelm. And I think for all that this verse can be overused and flung at people, there's something really interesting tucked into the center of it. See, because to be able to present our requests to God, we actually have to identify what it is that we actually need. We can get lost. We're not really great at this. We think the thing that we need is more food or, or more drink or more Netflix, but maybe the thing that we need is something different than that. Maybe the thing that we need is a chance to connect with friends and, reach, 
And, and so we need to reach out and make a coffee date. Maybe the thing that we need is, uh, can you go to the next slide, Carrie? Is, is uh, exercise. <laughs> Maybe we need to put on our coat and our shoes and go for a walk or a roll and do some yoga and go skiing or whatever our mo movement thing is. Apparently this was actually sent to Nathan as the joke for this week and he, um, he, didn't, he didn't choose it. So, you know, I don't know what that says. <laughs> Maybe the thing that we're overwhelmed about is, is because we haven't had a chance to create anything in a while. We haven't had a chance to do any art or, or dance or sing. Maybe we need to just like throw on some music and move our bodies around the kitchen. Maybe, maybe we're overwhelmed because we don't have enough resources. Our resources are lower than our needs, and that is legitimate. And a lot of us are in that place right now, but, but maybe we need to reach out for support and talk to a friend. And like, honestly, some of our, some of our overwhelm is for reasons that, that the only answer is, is a miraculous one. Sometimes we really do need God to miraculously provide. And I have watched God miraculously provide for people in this church for t more than 10 years, and it is an incredible privilege to see how that happens. But even then, there is a difference when we articulate, this is the thing that I need. This is the miraculous provision I need, God. It shifts the balance in these conversations. And then maybe, maybe... The last suggestion here is, is uh, we need to shift our assumption of what normal consumption looks like. Philippians 3, 17 to 20 talks about the need to choose who our examples are, to be intentional about who we're watching and who we're copying instead of just unconsciously following the crowd. And so maybe there are people you know who don't seem to overindulge and overconsume a lot. How are they doing it? Maybe those are the ones you want to start you know, following, keeping tabs on, trying to make sense of. Maybe you realize they have tools and skills that you don't have for navigating consumption. Maybe there's things you need to learn. Like ask them questions. That's what community is there for, right? We can learn from each other. The problem is, I think that all of this is good and helpful. There's real practical value and advice here. I really hope something in there is useful. But I'm not convinced we've gotten yet to our life-giving path. I think we're close, but I don't think we're exactly there yet. So instead of moderation, I want to suggest that our life-giving path is joy. See, I think that when we take joy in the bites of food we eat, joy in the conversations we have around the table with groups of friends, joy in what is going on around us, I think it will become impossible for us to act in gluttonous ways. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. rejoice. Joy is not a feeling that we accept or reject when it shows up. Joy is a practice. It's a discipline. It's a choice. It's a life-giving path. And I think to the extent that we seek joy, not forgetting, not numbing, not grasping, not trying to achieve something more, gluttony is going to completely fall off the table for us. Moderation is great, but so is brushing our teeth. You know, it helps us, moderation helps us save time and money and resources, but like, at the end of the day, life is hard, and maybe it just feels like too much to do that. It, moderation declutters our mental and physical space and leaves us free to live more, life more fully as God always intended it to be. Great, fine, whatever, it's also hard. And it opens us up to hopes and possibilities that we would not have otherwise been had access to. Whoop to freaking do. I'm not excited. Motivation, moderation, sorry, does not feel like a great motivation. It's life-giving realities are present, but they're those slow acting, boring, behind the scenes, long-term investments that we make. 
Like, 10 years from now, us will be excited about it, maybe. But, like, what has 10 years from now us done for us? Really? I haven't seen them around doing the dishes recently. It can feel really impossible to assume we'll have the motivation to look that far down the line in our life. And this is where joy comes in as our life-giving path. I think when we take joy in things, moderation will happen. I think when we seek joy, moderation will be a byproduct. I still think we should practice awareness and intentionality. I think we should slow down. I think for some of us, we might need to question and then shift our baselines a little bit. That's, that's, it's all well and good, but if we want to find the motivation to do this for the long haul, we need more than that. So with Lent starting this week, my question to you is, I wonder what it would look like if for you to take up the practice of joy for the next six weeks. What would it look like to choose to start celebrating even the smallest wins in your life and the lives of your friends and family? What would it look like to turn on Spotify and dance around the room just because you can? What would it look like to actively look out for God's presence in our lives in the smallest and least perceptible ways we can find and then take great delight and joy in them? I am well aware that many, if not most, if not almost all of us are struggling right now. I know the life is not easy for a lot of reasons at the moment. That can make joy feel a long way off. But you know what's full of joy? Okay, pizza, yeah, fair. But also the Psalms of Lament. The Psalms of Lament are full of, they're like three quarters lament. Everything is crappy in my life. Everything is going to pot. Nothing is good. Everything is horrible. And you get to the end in the last little bit, it says, and yet I will praise you. And yet I will choose to praise God. I will choose joy. If you want to do some digging, try looking up the word joy on Bible Gateway. And read through all the verses on joy. I looked this up in one translation. There were 203. Depending on the translation, you'll get you know, a few more, a few, few less. But like compared to the six or seven that there were on gluttony, this is, this is one of those overarching umbrella ideas in the Bible. So what would it look like for you to choose joy, even in the face of everything that's hard right now? because I think joy is our life-giving path. I think joy is what is going to bring us freedom from gluttony. Can I get the worship team to come back up? <laughs>